Jesus' last recorded words have come to be known as the Great Commission. This is an excerpt for, from the uh, NIV Open Bible, Thomas Nelson version. Uh, Jesus' last recorded words have come to be known as the Great Commission. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The book of Acts, written by Luke, is the story of the men and women who took that commission seriously and began to spread the news of a risen Savior to the most remote corners of the known world. Each section of the book, uh, books 1 through 7, 8 through 12, 13 through 28, focuses on a particular audience, a key personality, and a significant phase in the expansion of the gospel message. At the second volume, in a two-part work by Luke, this probably had no separate title, but all available Greek manuscripts designated by the title Praxis, Acts, or by an expanded title like the Acts of the Apostles. Praxis was commonly used in Greek literature to summarize the accomplishments of outstanding men. While the apostles were mentioned collectively at several points, this book really records the acts of Peter in books 1 through 12 and of Paul, books 13 through 28. And again, that was an excerpt from the uh, Thomas Nelson NIV Open Bible. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to read... Um, a little bit from Acts 1 of some of Jesus' words, and then we're going to jump from to uh, Acts 2, and I'd, like, I'd really like to read all of Acts 2 today. So if you get your Bibles out, we're going to be in Acts today, and if you don't have them, I think, I think they got all of that for up there. It's going to be a lot, but I think it should be up there. So uh, Luke talking here. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over the kingdom of God, oh, sorry, over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Jesus was taken up into heaven. Amazing instructions left by Jesus there. So let's go ahead and jump over to book two, and we're going to read about the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. Oh, sorry, book two, chapter two, excuse me. <laughs> when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, 
residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamph- Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them, said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days... God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Hallelujah. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Holy, excuse me, from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Hallelujah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accept this message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. When we are asked to believe Jesus 
and is not the belief that he existed or the belief that he is the Lord and Messiah or the belief that he was washed or has washed the sins clean when we are made aware of them. Jesus existed. So believing in him is not just thinking, oh yeah, no, Jesus, Jesus was, Jesus existed. Belief in Jesus is the faith that was poured out on everyone. Everyone. The Holy Spirit that was given to all, whether you think Jesus is real or not. He did die for your sins, and he was risen from the grave. Believing or having faith in Jesus as our Savior has a much deeper meaning to it. When Acts is read, there are many miracles that the apostles are able to be part of because they gave up everything else in order to follow God's teachings. His teachings are available in many tongues or languages, but the Bible has not yet been translated to every language in existence. It's amazing. There's that many languages that there are still some people that don't know God's word. But we live in a country where we are blessed that someone was able to speak in a tongue that we currently understand. No matter what language you speak here in this country, I'm guessing, I'm thinking, you have a translated Bible in that very language. The miracle that we can know God's words translated from a spirit-filled individual who passed on the knowledge to our language. The Word of God cannot and will not be stopped. His Word will be preached to the ends of the earth. Tongues are a powerful gift from the Holy Spirit and much needed. Paul, or Saul in Acts, was not at that gathering, or at least he isn't mentioned. I haven't researched it enough. Somebody can tell me whether he was there or not. No volunteers. <laughs> um, but he is mentioned after Stephen Stoning in Acts 7 and starts Acts 8 with Saul uh, consented to the stoning of Stephen. Hopefully everyone's read Acts. Everyone read Acts? Raise your hand if you read Acts. Okay. If you haven't read Acts, start today in book one. We read chapter two and uh, go through it. It's, it's amazing stuff. Read the book of Acts. It's, it's great. Uh, so it's written by Luke. Paul later in his letters writes uh, of the importance of tongues, but more importantly, the gift of prophecy. Prophecy is the same as tongues, the speaking of the Lord God, but in the language that you know and speak daily. So instead of speaking a language that you're, you don't know what you're saying, you're speaking a language that you know that are of the words of God. The importance of prophecy is that God can be clearly heard. Tongues are just as important as prophecy, but tongues are more suited to glorify God when you are around those who, uh, who don't speak the same language as you. The day of Pentecost is only three weeks away. We don't know the day or time of the things that God has commissioned to be. We are told to stay watchful and vigilant in prayer in Luke 21:36. Do not listen when people say the Lord has returned or the Lord will return on this day. In Matthew 24, uh, verse 4 and verse 23. For as lightning is visible from a great distance, so will be the day of the return of the Savior. Matthew 24, verse 27, remain vigilant. When we read about the accounts of the past, I often find myself waving it aside. That was so long ago. That's ancient history. Yes, it is history. Written down account of things that occurred. When the apostles decided to follow Jesus, 
they knew the Old Testament. It was taught to all Jewish people. They were believers in it because of the written accounts of Moses and Solomon, prophets like Isaiah, David, Ezekiel, and Elisha. And one of the 613 laws that was required, what required in Mosaic law was to bind the law to your head and your hands. And uh, we tend to understand that as you will have the law memorized and you will apply it to your hands in your daily life. So these people knew the law in and out, up and down. They didn't have to have a book to carry around with them. They knew everything that was written before the New Testament. They had it all memorized. The accounts of the apostles are a great reminder that miracles do happen. They are still happening, and it is not to prove the existence of God. Rather, it is just a byproduct of God being. God exists, so miracles exist. Sometimes we look too greatly on what consists of a miracle. Yes, a miracle is just that, something that occurs without explanation. More so than that, it is something that can only have occurred. Mm. We tend to think of miracles as what has already happened. Our worldly view trains us to think that that already happened won't happen again. We tend to put so much time on the past, on the way things used to be, on the way those miracles are no more. God asks us for faith, the belief in those things which are not seen. Some things that are unseen are the events to come, the future. We can predict to a certain degree many things about our worldly lives, but we cannot see what is to come. We can have a vision or a thought or a feeling of dread or a feeling of excitement. We can say, I can't wait. I know... Um, about six people in the past week that I've talked to that said, I can't wait. <laughs> so, I can't wait happens a lot. Or I worry when. These are the times when God has said, in Matthew 6.34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Or like in Luke 12, 29, and do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. Or in Proverbs 27, 1, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. And James 4, 14, we, uh, pretty sure we got to this in Bible study this morning, maybe not. Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Yet, Jeremiah 29, 11, I think everyone knows that one. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Hebrews 6, 19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Firm and secure, it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. And Romans 5.5 5 from Paul. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Amen. And in Acts 1.7, which we read earlier, we don't need to see the future to know that God has control of it. We don't need to worry about the future because it is another day that God has made. Amen. When we walk by faith and not sight, 2 Corinthians 5.7, we can begin to live like Noah. Hebrews 11.7, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness 
that is in keeping with faith. In Galatians 5.16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. May 28th is approaching. And we can be excited about City Fest. That's great. Hopefully everyone's excited about it. We can be expectant of something grand to occur for Pentecost. We could be afraid of the collapse of society. We could be all manner of insert your feelings. Yet feelings are not faith. Faith is by knowing and hearing the warnings that God has given. Basic instructions before leaving earth. I like when Dana talked about that last week. Bible. Following God and not the world. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Accept the gift that has been given to all of us. The greatest gift Holy Spirit has poured out. Faith. That's the greatest gift that was given by Holy Spirit is our faith. When Holy Spirit is gone, no longer will we have faith. Embrace that faith and use it, please. My hope is that we can all one day walk by the Spirit as God had intended us to. My hope is that we can all one day be in one accord with what God has in mind. My hope is that we can all live how God intends us to, to trust in Him completely, to not worry about what will come, but instead rejoice. Rejoice that the Lord's perfect will someday will be done, that God Himself knows the plans for you, every single one of you. They are not plans to harm you, but prosper you, plans to give you hope and a future. May God bless each of you today as you allow His perfect plan to be done. Let God take the reins of your worries and fears and anger and anything that is not of God. Let them go. Take your hand and put it over your heart. Come on. I want you to think about something that's been weighing you down. I want you to focus on that one thing. I want you to start to gently curl your fingers into a ball. But leave room in your palm. I want you to focus on that problem, and I want you to see that problem go into your palm. I want you to see that problem in your hand. You have that problem in your hand. Now I want you to grab hold of it. And I want you to lift it up. And I want you to open that hand up. And I want you to give that problem to God today. God, I can't hold on to this anymore. I cannot do this without you. I need you, God. And I lay this problem at your feet today. When we go into prayer and we have problems, how many of us leave problems at God's feet and we look at them and there it is, I I laid it down for you, God. It's right there at your feet. Well, I guess if you're not going to do anything about it, I'll pick it back up and carry it with me. And then you got to bring it back to Him. No, when we go in that time of prayer, when we need to leave something behind to God, leave it there. Don't leave that time of prayer until you've left that at the feet of God. And He wants everything that you have. He made you exactly how He wanted to make you. And He doesn't want you to be burdened in this life with anything. He wants to take the pain, the sorrow. He wants to take that away from you if you just let him take it. Our God is good, amen? 
And also, in times of prayer, tell him about the good things that are going on in your life. He wants to hear about that too, not just the bad. He likes to hear about the good stuff too. So um, I'm going to go ahead and close out in prayer. I thought about playing another song. If anybody needs to stay behind and um, just do a little bit more prayer time, get in touch with God, I'll go ahead and sing another song. But the rest of you will be uh, dismissed if you would like to go next door and partake in the breaking of the food. So, Lord, today I... Uh, I thank you so much for the place that you have put me in. Um, I can't believe that I'm up here speaking to others about how good and glorious you are because it seems like uh, 10 years went by really fast and I can't believe that just that long ago I was I was just like uh, just like one of those people of people of old of trying to persecute Christians. I, um, I tried to keep people from God. And Lord, I apologize. And I am so deeply sorry that I was ever that way. And I thank you so much that you are such a good God that you allow people like me to come to you. I mean, it doesn't matter what we've done in our past, Lord. You are so good and gracious that all you want to do is just keep giving. You want to give more and more grace, no matter what we have been going through. And you just want us to lay those things down at your feet, Lord, so that we can live for you. And we can allow your light to shine in our lives. So that when people see us, they see a reflection of you, Jesus. Not our... Uh, our own foolish aspirations to get ahead in this world or just live only for this world. But we know that there is something after this, God, and we want to be with you. Once we felt your presence, God, we never want to lose that. We never want to leave it. So, God, I want to do whatever I can to honor you and glorify you. Lord, I ask that you bless the food next door, and I thank you so much for every individual that is in this building today, and Lord, I thank you for everyone that is not in this building. I thank you for the gifts that Holy Spirit is, I, th I thank you for the gifts that Holy Spirit has given them. I thank you for the gift of faith. God, I, uh, I know we're all going through something. And I want you to just be right next to us as we go through this life. I don't want you to ever leave our side, Lord, and I know you won't. But I want to be able to come to you and share with you the things in my life that are going on. I want more of you, God. God, I thank you for the people who helped make the food today, and I, I thank you for the all the volunteers who are willing to give up their time to help with anything that is for your kingdom, God. And I, I mean, I just, there's there's so many people and so many things that I can be grateful for and thank you for. But I think I'm going to cut this short so that people can go get their food, God. 
We thank you and we love you so much. And in your precious name, Jesus, we pray to you. Amen. So you are free to go next door if you'd like.